our speaker for today is Dr. Rosmaliza Kamaludin from IIUM. Um, she uh, is a very passionate educator, uh, well versed in instructional technology and vocational uh, and technical education. So I hope as of today course, uh, I hope you will stay uh, throughout the session um, and hopefully will benefit as much as you can from this session um, to apply into your classes. All right, just uh, a few housekeeping announcements. Uh, you can post your question in the chat area on your right hand side, or you can unmute your mic uh, when Dr. Rose opened the QA se session uh, for you. So Adept will be recording this. Uh, you will be available, you will be able to see this uh, video uh, later at um, our official YouTube channel and also our website. So, um, without further ado, Dr. Rose, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Umu. Uh, thank you very much, ADEC, for having me today uh, with all of you at UM. <clears throat> so, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala barakatuh. And a very good morning to everyone. I hope that uh, this morning, all of you have already had your breakfast and um, you know you can um, always uh, come in and out of the session being at home so it gives us more flexibility uh, i am aware that it is going to be a very long day for both of us for you and me 9 to 12 2 to 5 it's no joke for her an online session so i am going to be doing it in chunks uh, there will be breaks there will be uh, activities that you are going to do on your own uh, if there are videos to watch then you will be watching them on your own um, and then we will get back to the session and stuff like that so it's going to be a var variety you will not be bored with me talking for the next three or six hours okay uh, and we all, uh, I hope that we would all enjoy today's session and uh, bring something home. Okay. Um, one, uh, one thing about, uh, you know, all these tools, I think I am not very friendly with teams at this point of time. Uh, I will probably need to learn a lot more about Teams as I'm not used to using it. I am more familiar with Zoom. Uh, Google Meet is okay for me. Webex is fine. Uh, Teams is like, you know, I'm struggling with it a bit. So I hope that you would all bear with me on the technicalities of Teams, uh, especially when sharing screens and all that. I can't see you and I do not have a second screen. I tried to uh, log into another screen, but you know, I need to sign up and stuff like that. So that's fine. Okay, so this morning, inshallah, um, I've been tasked to present, uh, to, to sort of facilitate the course called Developing and Designing Courses. Okay, so I'm going to be sharing my screen. Okay. And uh, all right, Umu, can I do a quick check? Is uh, my slide visible? Uh, yes, we can oh. see your slide. Okay, excellent. Thank you. So designing and developing courses, of course, now the trend is going hybrid. I hope it's going to go hybrid, not fully online. Uh, um, you know, and we hope for the best in March. Some students are going to come back and uh, some students will still be at home. Therefore, the courses that we're talking about is perhaps the hybrid courses that we're going to go through. And um, I will not be focusing so much on designing and developing new courses. I believe it is, you know, transferring the courses that you have onto this hybrid mode. And uh, I believe that UM is already a champion of this because uh, you have the, you know, the, um, you know, that, that week where you do not have 
physical classes and it's all online. Therefore, uh, I need to learn from you. Yeah, because UIA, we did not have such things prior to COVID. So it's a very much struggle for everyone at IUM. However, we have managed to pull through and Alhamdulillah, it's been a, a good ride, a good journey. OK, right, enough of me babbling this morning. This is uh, the Padlet link uh, that, you know, I will be using where I store all the materials um, there that we need for today's activities. So I'm going to give you like one minute to get this set up on your devices. Perhaps you can scan it uh, on your mobile or you can, you know, type in the link. The link is, is pretty simple, I believe. That would get you to Padlet. OK, once you are uh, able to open the Padlet, please uh, type into the chat box. Yes, and then Umu will, you know, check for me if everybody is on Padlet already. OK, if, you're, if you are successful at going into Padlet, then just type in the chat box. Yes, and Umu will help me monitor. Do we have yeses, Umu? Um, yes, we have three yeses. OK, thank you very much. We'll just give it another couple of seconds, like 20 seconds or so, for people to get set up with Padlet. Yeah. Um, at any point of time that you need to interrupt and ask me questions, please do so. If you type it into the chat box and Umu will alert me, uh, you are also welcome to switch on your microphones. I do not have a specific uh, session for Q&A. I would like to have it more conversational so that I feel there's somebody on the other side of the screen. It is bad enough that I cannot see who the participants are. So if you just, you know, would like to shout out something, I know I'm talking to somebody. Okay. So Umu, how uh, many? We yeah, have? we have almost uh, of them say yes. And oh, we just okay. a few more that didn't try yet. Okay, no problem. So All right. this is uh, the link and also um, the QR code. Okay, thank you. I'm going to move on. So we've got that set up. Now this is our first activity of the day. Okay, this. Uh, image can also be found on the Padlet if uh, for some reason it's not clear. There are six hidden words in this uh, picture. So I would like all of you to find the six hidden words. I'm going to give you 30 seconds for this activity. I'm going to time you in uh, 30 seconds begins now. Find six hidden words. Uh, once you have found them, type them into the chat box and Umu will monitor them for me. Okay. Well, we have a few answers already. All right, excellent. So we'll um, 10 seconds, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Okay. Time's up. Okay, so now Umu, what are the words that they have found? Okay, Can you read uh, most of them are found right, mm -hmm. test and learn. Right, test and learn, okay. Yes, one person found quiz. Okay, good. Okay, uh, and... that's all is um, the answer that they got. Okay, so now I'm going to show you where the rest of the words are. Can you see me annotating, Umu? Uh, yes. Okay, you can see me putting a red circle, right? Right. Okay, great. So I'm going to use this to show you where the hidden words are. Just bear with me. I need to get my colors right uh, so that you can see it. Okay. All right. 
So you found learn there, right? Yeah, yeah, let's learn. And then you should, you said you found write. Okay, write is over there. Okay, and then you found test. Okay, that's where test belongs. In the waste paper baskets, I suppose. Okay, that's test. And uh, you should be able to find this quiz down there, yeah? Okay, there's a quiz down there. And then one more not so obvious, you can find report. You see it? Oh, okay. You see the report there? It's um, the Rose. Yeah. Can huh? can you try share again your screen? Oh, okay. Right. Dr. Vimala, I'm sorry. Can you unshare your screen? Thank you. Okay. Okay, so now can you see? Yeah. Uh, yes, we can see your screen. Okay, great. So report right there. And finally, this is one that people miss a lot. If you can like, you know, squint your eyes a little bit, you can see the word study there. Aha, uh -huh. there we go. That one is not so obvious, right? So that's six for you. Learn, report, test, quiz, write, and study. Right, okay. So I'm going to stop sharing for a moment. Now in the chat box. Let's put my chat box. Okay. Why don't you type in what you learned from this activity? What did you learn from this activity? Hang on, I lost my chat box. Where's my chat box? Okay. Uh, it's on the top. Maybe you can share your screen, the, the team screen. Okay. Okay. Mm. Okay, you don't have your chat, All right? Uh, hold on, hold on. <laughs> Let me share mine and. Okay. Hey, well, I'm talking about teams. I apologize. Ah, oh, and you can see me. Yay, okay. Okay, now. Okay. Learn from this, okay, observation, evaluation, activities related to teaching and learning need to be more focused. Activities. Some are obvious, not great one. Uh, Dr. Song Si Loi, uh, attention, yeah, okay, can we go down further? Uh, to be observant, engagement in class, yeah, thank you very much. So there is an annoying buzzing sound at the background, yep, <laughs> somebody's uh, phone, I I think if you if you use your phone, then um, you know it would be uh, bothering probably the um, application. But anyway, great learning from that simple thirty second activity. What's not so obvious about the learning is that you know some words are clear, uh, where some words are not. Uh, for example, the word report just now, it was there, but I think it was a little bit too decorative and also the word study the word is there but it is too small to be seen and not really clear it's very blurry this is how we can represent online learning experiences not just online learning um, perhaps also um, you know the uh, learning that we do face to face Okay, uh, thank you, Umu. I can, uh, I mean, you can stop sharing already. So um, the point is, whenever that we design or develop courses, whenever we want to teach, whenever we want to do assessment, we have got to be clear from the beginning. Okay, it cannot be too decorative, 
too much, you know, good to knows, but we do not focus on the must knows. We must also be uh, mindful of the messages that we are conveying to the students. Okay, we do not want it to be like the word study. It is there. We think that we have conveyed it to the students, but it is blurry and cannot be seen. It is somehow, somehow hidden or misinterpreted or simply is not visible to the students. OK, so bearing in mind all of these points that we get from our first very short activity, this is how we are going to kickstart the workshop on designing and developing courses. OK, I um, I apologize for that. OK, I think we should all silence our phones. I forgot to remind myself that as well. So today when we are talking about designing and developing um, courses, I am not going to dwell so much on the theoretical part, but rather I would like it to be more hands on. OK, which means that all of you will need to be designing and uh, developing uh, how you are going to do your instruction for a hybrid learning experience for your students using, of course, the principles and also the models of instructional design that has been researched throughout, um, you know, the decades of learning. OK, I'm going to go back to my slide. OK, and we shall leave this. Going to the next slide. OK, so today what we are going to do is first we're going to look at how people learn before we even go to the drawing board. We need to learn this because that is the biggest stakeholder in this whole process. And secondly, we're going to look at the fundamentals of education. OK, we need to see what are the actual goals and purposes people get educated. Third, we are going to look at the fundamentals of instructional design. How are we going to use the tools and the theories and um, the models that have been developed in order to, number four, design all of this learning, all of these courses um, that we would like the students to achieve. OK, so this is our learning points for today. This is very special for all of you. I'm going to go into details and a lot of activities because usually um, it would be a two hour or three hour session and we do not get to do a lot of hands on. But today all of you are the chosen ones who will get to do all of these fun activities. Hopefully it's fun for you because it's fun for me. But anyway, so these are the four learning points that we're going to address. OK, at any point in time uh, you have a question again, I would like to remind you, you may ask them in the chat box or you may switch on your microphones. OK, so now we've got that out of the way. Bear in mind what we're going to do today. OK, Oops, sorry. Now. To kickstart. What is the best memory that you have ever had? as a student when you were learning. Throughout the years that we went through some form of education, it doesn't matter whether it is in school, whether it is homeschool, it is in kindergarten, in a particular learning workshop. What was the best memory of learning that you have ever had in your life? OK, I would like you to think of that one memory and then I want you to say out what was it that you remember the most about that experience? OK, there must be that one particular class or one particular learning session that you really, really remember until now. What was the best memory of it? What was it that you really remember until now? OK, you can switch on your microphone or you can type it into the chat box. OK. Um, Umu, if somebody is typing into the chat box, can you just read it out for me? Okay, uh, no, no chat yet. Okay, 
So it just, you know, it takes a while. It takes probably a few seconds for you to jog your memory. So what was that one best experience that you've ever had? Of course, as a student, not as a teacher or a lecturer, because that would be a bit short sendiri lah kan. Uh, so as a student, what was the best memory that you have ever had? Do we have any responses yet? Uh, okay, uh, we have two here. Okay. From Dr. Donny. Okay. Uh, I had a teacher who is an excellent chalk thrower. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, that could be a science teacher, right? Is that a science teacher? I don't know. Usually science teachers are good artists. Okay. And the next one? Uh -huh. uh, okay, from Dr. Lee Eiling. Mm -hmm. A lecturer demonstrating a concept using a toy. Uh, okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, any more responses? All right, from Dr. Fazril. Mm -hmm. uh, science classes, uh, standard six. We did a lot of experiment. It was very interactive. Mm -hmm. Teacher was engaging and made learning fun. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, we we always remember um, that fun class. Does anybody remember something that's not fun? <laughs> okay. Right. So, yeah. Dr. Nur said, my stats professor. Uh -huh. Then um, Madam Vinotini said, no entering the classes without dictionary. Oh my goodness. Okay, now that's, that's probably, you know. Uh, a very fierce English teacher. Usually English teachers are the ones who are most animated, right? Okay, so thank you very much for your responses. Now, those memories that you have had that you told uh, everyone about, they are mostly related to what you went through as opposed to the particular subject, what was being taught on that particular day. Very seldom do we get people who remember exactly what was being taught, what formula was being used, but rather you remember what happened, the people, the things that you did, the toys, um, even sometimes you can remember the smell of it. So therefore, what creates memory? What creates memory is experience, right? So there's this two uh, dichotomy that's going on here. One part of the learning is the content and one part of the learning is experience. What we remember the most usually is the experience. We remember the teacher. We remember what was being done in the class. We remember the toys, we remember the food. We remember um, the acts, the plays. Very seldom do we bring out content as our best memory of learning. However, when we design or when we develop courses or learning um, materials and all that, we are very much focused on the content. We forget that experience is a crucial part of the learning process. Therefore, when we design um, courses or when we design classes, we need to factor in what would stimulate the best experiences that the student will remember and will carry throughout his or her life. Yeah. It is with that experience, the content will be sort of a byproduct of that particular memorable learning experience. Okay. So this is what we need to bear in mind when we design or develop courses. What is the learning experience that we would like the students to go through so that they will remember it for the rest of their lives and make an impact? And this is what makes a difference. OK. So therefore, Albert Einstein once said, learning is experience. Everything else is just information. OK, and of course, um, right now with technology and stuff, information is, you know, is accessible. You can you can get it anywhere and everywhere. Content is there. But how do we make 
that learning experience relevant to the particular student so that, that information that they get will turn into a very usable um, and meaningful knowledge okay so now jogging your memories again when we were children how did we learn when we were five, six, how did we learn? Type into the chat box. And ooh, um, you are my eyes and my ears. How did we learn as children? And type into the chat box. Um, there's some answer here. Okay. Uh, okay. All right. Special learning. Yeah. Imitate trial and error. Right. By looking at others. Mm -hmm. Learn through play by doing by breaking rules. Excellent. Singing Excellent. songs, play, sing. Yeah. Those things are fun, aren't they? Right. As children, learning was fun, and it was mostly, you know, accidental in the commas. Uh, whatever that we did informally are the ones that we find most engaging and what we find most uh, rewarding. Now, all of those activities that you mentioned, learning to play, imitating others, you know, making mistakes and stuff like that, which part of the body did you use to do all those activities? Which part of the body do you think you used to do play, to do imitating, um, to do all these things. Which part? Any answers in the chat box? Which part of the body? Hands. Okay. Uh, one like straight answer entire body. Okay. The limbs and the face. All right. And the point is, we used all of our senses. We use all of our body. We use sight. We use sound. We use smell. We use taste. We use touch. Sometimes we use our sixth sense. For those of you who, you know, had some weird childhood. <laughs> anyway, we used the whole body to learn, and this is what creates memorable experiences. Right, we were fully engaged, we were fully immersed in the process. It is not just the physical part of the body, but rather we use our hearts, our soul, everything just comes together very naturally. And all of these experiences that we went through as children shaped our lives. Yeah, um, when we play. You know, pono pono play masa masa. We played, you know, the uh, lompat getah. We played so many things. So those are actually embedded with so much of math, so much of science, so much of logic, so much of you know, problem solving, decision making. All of those things are in there. When we climb trees, we you know, we do so many things that we feel our kids today miss out on. So it is that kind of experience that we want to create for our students. It is involving the whole self. This is what we call the holistic education that we've been talking so much about. What is this holistic education? What is this, you know, having the 21st century skills, the workplace skills and stuff like that is actually involving the whole self in the learning experience. We used to play as kids, but when we got educated, all of the senses are shut down except for one, which is our ears. You know, when we go to school, uh, teachers say, okay, sit down, be quiet and listen. 
So we have been overloading this one particular sense, which is our uh, sound, our hearing sense, overloading it too much during school, during the university, that you know we forget how to listen. So why not we involve the whole body, the whole self in the learning experience? especially when we get all these kids from the schools that are deprived of learning um, from other senses except for the hearing and we, when they come and study with us at the university again we are overloading them with the hearing right even in an online environment of course it is challenging now, how do we maneuver um, through all of the tools and the gadgets that we have so that it, the whole body is still involved in the learning process? All right. Um, so now I would like to pause there for, for a bit before we get to the next part. So I'm going to stop sharing for a bit. And I would like to, you know, open the floor for any questions or comments at this point of time. Anybody have any comments? Um, you are welcome to, you know, to share and switch on your microphones. No. No comments at this point of time, or is there in the chat box? Um, uh, nothing in the chat box. All right, so I'm going to move on to the next part then. And share again. Okay. So next part. Why does one get educated? So we're going to go into the goals and purposes of education. Now we know how people learn best, which is involving the whole body. You do know that the learning styles is a myth, right? The visual, auditory, kinesthetic, and read and write and all that. We actually choose how we prefer to learn based on the given circumstances and also based upon the um, stimulus that we get. So we get to choose actually what our learning preferences are. Of course, we do prefer one to the other, but again, it is not a hard and fast rule. OK, so therefore I am uh, I'm going to go through that, how we design so that we can include most of the senses in our learning experience. OK, so now why does one get educated? What is the goal and actual purpose of education. When we look back, uh, just now I mentioned that, you know, once we get to school, we get educated, we sort of deprive our senses and uh, we are not getting the full deal here when we go to school. So what is the real purpose then? Why should even why should we even go to school? OK. So to answer that question, let's look at Malaysia's purpose of education. We have our own philosophy, yeah? And if we look and read this carefully and examine it, it is beautiful. It is pro probably one of the most perfect philosophies that one can ever have when it comes to education. Because we aim to produce individuals who are intellectually, spiritually, emotionally, physically balanced and harmonic based on a firm belief and devotion to God. So that is like so beautiful, right? We want this holistic person like we talked about. And why do we want these people to come out of our education system? so that they are capable of achieving high level of personal well-being as well as being able to contribute to the harmony and betterment of the family the society and the nation at large that is our purpose 
And this is not just a philosophy for lower education, but it is also for higher education. Universities in Malaysia should produce these graduates. It is beautiful on paper. Are we successful? Maybe when we look at the students that we produce. Some of them are, you know, very successful in industry. Some of them are in academia. Um, they're very successful at their family and all that. So what I mean, how far have we been successful at producing these people? We don't know. There's no particular number. There's no particular holistic study that looks at the achievement of our Fasafah Pendidikan Kebangsaan. It has been there since the first version was in 1984, 19, I think so, 1984, 1986, and then the revised version um, in 1993, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so we have had two iterations. But how is it successful? I don't know. However, it is beautiful. If all the lecturers in the university hold on to this philosophy in, you know, in teaching and research in publication, whatever that we do, then the outcome would be perfect. Based on this perfect philosophy, right? Now that's Malaysia. You might think, oh, okay, this is in our country. Well, what about the global context? Now, if we look at UNESCO's five pillars of learning, when they talk about SDG, sustain sustainable development goals, yeah, SDG number four is uh, is about education. So what do they say about what should go on when somebody gets educated? The first one. Okay, the first one, learning to know. Learning to know is your content knowledge. You know about things. The second one is learning to do. We know how to do things. It's about skills. It's about being able to produce something with hands, um, being able to, you know, make decisions, being, learning to do, to do things. Number three, learning to be. Now, this is a big question whether we have done it or not, but it is in our philosophy. Learning to be is about how we can help our students, our learners, our youth to become the best version of themselves through the process of education, which means they have gained the content knowledge, they have gained all of the skills that they needed to gain, but now how do they use all of this information, all of those skills in order to become the best version? OK, the best version is what? It's this person. The individual who is intellectually, spiritually, emotionally and physically balanced and harmonic. This is the best version. In the Malay version of this philosophy, it says we are to produce insan sejahtera. So this person, if we know them, they would be, you know, somebody who is with integrity, who is responsible, who is knowledgeable, uh, who is empathetic. So this perfect being, right? So learning to be. And then when these individuals have become the best versions of themselves, now they need to learn how to live together with other people. So that's number four, learning to live together. And number five, once they have learned how to live together, it's learning to transform oneself and society towards the better, right? If you look at number four and number five, learning to live together and learning to transform oneself and society, it is this is this is what we want to achieve, achieving high level of personal well-being to contribute to the harmony and betterment of the family, society and the nation at large. They go hand in hand and we wrote our philosophy first. UNESCO wrote it later in the year 2000. OK, 
So we have always had, as a nation, we have always had this idea of producing well-balanced person, and we have never talked about producing for the workplace, producing for the workforce. We've never talked about that. If they are able to get good jobs, that is a byproduct. That is an outcome of this individual, this balanced individual. Okay. So now why are we elaborating so much on this philosophies? Because at the end of the day, the education that everybody receives should turn that person into a better person from somebody who doesn't know, somebody who is knowledgeable, somebody who doesn't know to do something, to somebody who is skillful, and somebody who is ignorant, to somebody full of compassion and empathy, so that when a person becomes a better person than they were, they should be able to become useful in the society and not cause any problems, yeah? Bearing this in mind, as higher educationists, we tend to focus on the first two, you know, being knowledgeable, being skillful. But the third one, to being compassionate, it is difficult to put on paper. How do we design a course that would include this, that would include this element, right? How do we put it on paper? How do we assess it that's the biggest question yeah we can <clears throat> you know do community surveys uh, in the um, course we can do service-based learning uh, we can do sustainable um, activities and all that but how do we assess that how do we know that this person is actually compassionate we can't quantitate we cannot quantify it that's why we sort of, you know, let it pass us by or just, you know, do it. Okay, we'll do it. Um, but the outcome, we, we just can't explicitly put it down on paper. How do we grade a person uh, for compassion? How does one get a B? How does one get a B plus? Right? So that is, you know, just uh, not, quanti not quantifiable not attractive to be put in there okay so now we know the goals and purposes of education it all sums up to this you can teach a person to do something but it does not mean that they have learned right i've taught snoopy to whistle i can't hear him whistle i said that i taught him not that he learned so the whole point here is when we are designing courses, we are designing our classes, our activities and all that, what we are doing as educators is we are providing the environment, we are providing the stimulus so that the students would be given the best circumstances for learning. Yeah, that's how designers work. It should be, it should be the best environment that they are given, okay? Whether they receive it or not, now they have to decide. How do they make that decision whether to learn it or not to learn it? We need to help them make that decision. We need to give them the best stimulus. We need to give them um, the best... Uh, you know, tools, the best content so that they would be led towards the decision to learn. Okay. So that's the difference right there. Um, you know, learning from uh, the experiences of our prophets, of, of Prophet uh, Muhammad, so salam, uh, learning from, you know, Prophet Isa, alayhi salam, uh, they convey the message, but it does not necessarily mean that people learn. 
they might be giving the best circumstances of learning, but it does not necessarily that uh, means that the people would accept it. So we need to be clear of our role right here today as designers and developers of courses. We do our best to design it. I've given you the platter. I've given you this beautiful garden of knowledge. Uh, now it is up to you learners to immerse yourself in the experience. Okay, based on the goals just now that we have talked about. Okay, we talked about, um, you know, this FASAFA. We talked about the UNESCO's five pillars of learning. We've summarized it. So now keeping all of this end goal in mind, now we can really be clear about how we are going to maneuver the course so that students will get the best out of them, regardless of uh, whether they are doing this online, whether they're going to come back to campus or if it's going to be a hybrid kind of thing. OK, I'm going to pause there um, for a bit. And I'm going to leave some room for responses and questions right now. OK, Umu, if you have any thing. OK. <clears throat> All right. So we've got a lot actually in the tech chat box. Dr. Zahir said, how do students learn best when they are sat in front of the PC all day? Um, that is a very valid concern. Students don't like to talk using gadgets rather than face to face. Um, I don't think most college teachers know about the philosophy. Yeah, uh, not to Lee Eiling. Uh, because it has been emphasized a lot in uh, lower education but it has not been talked too much about in higher education yeah but all the talk now is to produce graduates who are industry ready yes i still remember sekolah bukan penjara university bukan kilang yeah um i've read a similar book uh i cannot remember the title but it was in the west the failure of higher education or something like that i can't remember but it talks about the same thing um Three Idiots movie, yes. <laughs> it's this University of Pressure Cooker, yes. I love that movie too, uh, Dr. Vinotini. And then any more uh, comments that they did? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, how do we engage our students when they are in front of the PC the whole day? Uh, I have a living proof at home. Um, I have a 19 year old son who is going through his foundation. Okay, he is one of the transition, the COVID batches. You know, there's COVID batches, the kids who go from kindergarten to standard one, from standard six to form one, and then the uh, SPM to foundation. So he's the SPM to foundation one. Uh, one day he came to me that he says, I don't think I can do this anymore. Uh, this is not working for me. It's crazy to learn in front of the computer and I don't know anybody. Of course you don't know anybody because you've never met them. You've never met your course mates. This is the first time, first semester foundation. It's crazy and they are 18 year olds, 19 year olds. It is that time when peer means the most, right? You need to be with your gang. You need to have people around you. Learning is social. But that social element has been taken away by the pandemic. Yeah. So I told what did I, what was the solution that I gave him? Okay. Number one, I asked him, are there any friends living nearby within the PKP range? Are there any friends living nearby? If there are, get together. You can, you know, come to, you can ask your friend to come to the house. Uh, or you can go somewhere where you can meet. At that time, it was not the second PKP yet. It was the PKPB, okay? Uh, you can meet at a cafe. You can go to the library uh, and just have somebody sitting there with you learning together. And he said, yes, I have a friend. Wonderful. So what did he do? Um, they got together. And then sometimes they come to the house. Sometimes they went to the library. Um, and they just went in class, uh, online class together. So they were just there together. Uh, at least there's somebody there, okay, uh, to talk to. 
And then um, that was number one solution. And lo and behold, it worked. It motivated him. It was like, you know, very refreshing and he wasn't depressed anymore. And then PKP 2.0 hit. It happened again, but it wasn't as bad. Why? Because he has met at least one or two friends face to face. So the, the comment about kids prefer to communicate using gadgets is not entirely true, actually. They want that face to face, that human touch. Um, and uh, that gadget face to face would come later. OK, so this uh, what does this implicate? This implies that, you know, when we do our course design, I know people have been saying do asynchronous. You don't have to do synchronous because it's going to um, burden their bandwidth, the data and stuff like that. But you do need the synchronous session. You do need, but you don't need it every day. OK, you can do it like once in two weeks, the synchronous session, because they need to know that there are people behind the screen, real people. OK, uh, I know they don't switch on their cameras um, for some reason, because why? Because they are lying on the bed. During class, just listening. OK, um, that's why they don't switch it on. They don't even have baths until after the whole, maybe at two o'clock, three o'clock, it will come up and Monday and all that. But yeah, uh, that is from my personal experience. Um, so I'm not assuming that this hap this is happening. It is actually happening with our students. Yeah. Uh, they do prefer this, uh, you know, engagement face to face. Uh, some of them feel frustrated because they are deprived of it. But given the choice, they would probably, you know, prefer face to face interaction like this. Uh, and then, yeah, so that's that's my response um, to all of your comments in the chat box just now. Uh, any other questions, uh, Umu? Are there any other comments that we can respond to? No? OK. So now, um, what I would like to do is before we go on to instruction. Yes, we just have to thank Okay, so um, before we move on to the next section um, of really the technical part, the instructional design, um, I am going to let all of you watch this. Uh, this video on your Padlet, the first video, video one, changing education paradigms. Now this was by the late Sir Ken Robinson. I'm a big fan. This video was 10 years ago and I want you to pay attention how this video is more relevant than ever now, more relevant than it was when it was produced. OK, so the video is about 11 or 12 minutes. Therefore, I'm not going to play it here in Microsoft Teams. I'm going to allow you to watch it on your own. Um, I'm going to come back in 15 minutes after all of you have watched it. So we will resume at 1010. .10. OK, we will resume the Microsoft Teams session at 1010 .10 right now. Mm, I'm going to share my screen schedule to show you the where the video is on Padlet. OK, so right here is video one. Changing education paradigms, so watch that one first and then we are going to come back and we're going to talk about how this video is more relevant than ever now. OK. All right, excellent. Uh, so I will switch off my mic and my video so that you can all watch the video. We'll come back again at 10.10. 10. Okay, Umu? Every country...
first of them is economic. People are trying to work out how do we educate our children to take their place in the economies of the 21st century? How do we do that? Given that we can't anticipate what the economy will look like at the end of next week, as the recent turmoil is demonstrating. How do we do that? The second, though, is cultural. Every country on, the earth, on earth is trying to figure out how do we educate our children so they have a sense of cultural identity and so that we can pass on the cultural genes of our communities while being part of the process of globalization. How do we square that circle? The problem is they're trying to meet the future by doing what they did in the past. And on the way, they're alienating millions of kids who don't see any purpose in going to school. When we went to school, we were kept there with a story, which is if you worked hard and did well and got a college degree, you would have a job. Our kids don't believe that. And they're right not to, by the way. You're better having a degree than not, but it's not a guarantee anymore. And particularly not if the route to it marginalizes most of the things that you think are important about yourself. And some people say we have to raise standards as if this is a breakthrough. You know, like, really, yes, I, we should. Why would you lower them? You know, I mean, I, I haven't come across an argument that persuades me of lowering them. But raising them, of course we should raise them. The problem is that the current system of education was designed and conceived and structured for a different age. It was conceived in the intellectual culture of the Enlightenment and in the economic circumstances of the Industrial Revolution. Before the middle of the 19th century, there were no systems of public education. Not really. I mean, you could get educated by Jesuits, you know, if, if you had the money. But public education, paid for from taxation, compulsory to everybody and free at the point of delivery, that was a revolutionary idea. And many people objected to it. They said it's not possible for many street kids, working class children, to benefit from public education. They're incapable of learning to read and write, and why are we spending time on this? So there's also built into it a whole series of um, assumptions about social structure and capacity. It was driven by an economic imperative of the time, but running right through it um, was an intellectual model of the mind, which was essentially the Enlightenment view of intelligence. That real intelligence consists in the capacity for a certain type of deductive reasoning and a knowledge of the classics originally, what we come to think of as academic ability. And this is deep in the gene pool of public education, that there are really two types of people, academic and non-academic, smart people and non-smart people. And the consequence of that is that many brilliant people think they're not, because they've been judged against this particular view of the mind. So we have a, a twin pillars, economic and intellectual. And my view is that this model has caused chaos in many people's lives. It's been great for some. There have been people who have benefited wonderfully from it. But most people have not. Instead, they suffer this. This is the modern epidemic, and it's as misplaced and it's as fictitious. This is the plague of ADHD. Now, this is a map of the instance of ADHD in America, or prescriptions for ADHD. Don't mistake me here. I don't mean to say there is no such thing as attention deficit disorder. I'm not qualified to say if there is such a thing. I know that a great majority of psychologists and, and pediatricians think there is such a thing. But it's still a matter of, dis of debate. What I do know for a fact is it's not an epidemic. These kids are being medicated as routinely as we had our tonsils taken out. And on the same whimsical basis, and for the same reason, medical fashion. Our children are living in the most intensely stimulating period in the history of the Earth. They're being to information and caught their attention from every platform, computers, from iPhones, from advertising audience, from hundreds of television channels. And we're penalizing them now for getting distracted. From what? Boring stuff <laughs> at school for the most part. It seems to me it's not a coincidence totally. The instance of ADHD has risen in parallel with the growth of standardized testing. But these kids are being given insulin and Adderall and all manner of things, often quite dangerous drugs, to get them focused and calm them down. Because of this, attention deficit disorder increases as you travel east across the country. People start losing interest in Oklahoma. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
and they can hardly think straight in Arkansas. <laughs> and by the time they get to Washington, they've lost it completely. <laughs> and there are separate reasons for that, I believe. <laughs> it's a fictitious epidemic. If you think of it, the arts, and I don't say this exclusively the arts, I think it's also true of science and of maths, but let me, I say about the arts particularly because they are victims of this mentality currently, particularly. It's 10.09. Um, I hope everyone has already watched the uh, video, Ken Robinson's video. And you're with me, right? Uh, I just found out that if I'm not in the team, meaning I'm not in your organization like you am, I don't have access to the chat. So that's one thing about teams. There's a lot of uh, restrictions can, uh, with teams. That's why I still prefer <coughs> it, uh, I still prefer Zoom uh, or WebEx. Uh, Google I mean, is it's, it's okay. It's still much better than Teams. So Teams have got a lot to work with luck as they have a lot of restrictions as to the membership and all that kind. But anyway, uh, it is pretty stable. It's a pretty stable platform. Okay, so if you are with me, uh, you don't have to say anything, but just, you know, switch on your mic and then switch it off again. I think that's how I can know if you are there back with me. Yeah, I can see some uh, switching on. And, well, you can just switch on and switch off your mic again. That's all. That's an indication of who is there, who's not there. You don't have to say anything. Okay, great, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Susanna, you raised your hand. Would you like to say something? Or that's an indication that you are here? Okay, I think just an indication that you're here. Okay, thank you. So we are back and uh, from the video just now, I would like you to do your own reflections. Uh, <clears throat> on what he has been saying about the goal of education and stuff like that. So it's like a reflection, okay? Um, it summarizes the whole goal of education section very nicely. Um, we That was 10 years ago, and uh, people like him have been advocating and advocating. When COVID hit, I believe if Sir Ken Robinson was still alive, he would be very happy to see education changing uh, you know, with the help of technology uh, and post pandemic. Hopefully things will not go back to the way it used to be for education. It should be better. And people started to rethink about, you know, assessments, about, you know, really thinking what do we really need to teach? What are the must knows? What are the things that were unnecessary before? Uh, and we have begun to realize what is important to be conveyed to the students, right? So now uh, I would like to begin the instructional design part, right? Instructional design. This is this was a knowledge that was deemed necessary for those who are in the online learning business. It doesn't matter whether it is academic or whether it is the industry. Uh, it was originally this field was originally, um, you know, started by the people in the corporate training, the industrial training. They needed to have a system to get learning across for their employees. For academics, we have our own academic take on instructional design, okay? But the corporate, because they do not have uh, the academic background, they came to this drawing board of instructional design out of need um, to sort of structure training programs. Yeah. 
So George Simmons said, instructional design is the arts and science of creating an instructional environment and materials that will bring the learner from the state of not being able to accomplish certain tasks to the state of being able to accomplish those tasks. So somebody who comes in will come out a better person. Right. So it is based on, of course, uh, research uh, theories in the areas of cognition, educational psychology and problem solving. So this is what instructional design is. OK, why is it important? Now in developing or designing courses, because instructional design gives you a holistic picture on how to create the blueprint of a certain course. You know what you want to teach, you know how you want to assess them, and you know what are the activities that are suitable. OK, as academics, um, not from the field of education, we go through a lot of trainings how to teach. But how to put them together? That is the big question. Uh, our knowledge about, you know, um, cost learning outcomes is compartmentalized. Our knowledge about student centered learning is compartmentalized. Our knowledge about assessment is compartmentalized. So how do we get them to be coherent and become harmonious with one another? So now that is instructional design. How to bring everything together, right? Uh, just an example, I know if we talk about instructional design, we don't talk about eddy. It is like, you know, drinking coffee without sugar or without milk, so it's a bit incomplete. ADDI instructional design model is one of the most um, used, widely used. It explains the phases that happens in an instructional design process. The first phase being analysis, second is design, develop, implement and evaluate. So I'm just going to go through all this very briefly. There's another model called the Ashwa model. The Ashwa model was developed to help teachers decide on the learning materials uh, that they would like to use in the classroom. So Ashwa stands for Analyze Learner Characteristics, State the Objectives of the Learning, Select, Modify or Design Materials, Utilize the Materials and then Require Learner Response and then there's Evaluation in the Phase. Okay. That's one model. Another model is called backward design. Now this one is, you know, very popularly used in higher education. Identify desired results, which is the learning outcomes. Determine acceptable evidence, which is assessment. And then finally, you plan for learning experiences and instruction, which is your learning activities. All right, so this is backward design. You identify the end, the end game first. Where would you like the students to be? And then you plan backwards. OK. There's another model. This is slightly different by John Keller. That's his name. The arts motivational model, which says that a certain lesson or a certain cause, certain learning experience, must first gain attention of the students. Then after that, once the students have given you their attention, we have to make the material relevant to the students. Make it relevant for the students to stay and keep on learning because when they stay and they keep on learning, having the motivation to learn, it will build their confidence in using the knowledge or the skills that they have gained on their own. Once this confidence is built, they know how to use it, they know how to solve problems with it. They will be satisfied with the whole learning experience, the whole learning process, and they will come back for more. They will come back for the next day or the next week or the next semester, they come looking for you again. So this is the arts motivational model. Now these are some examples of how instructional design process goes on. Yeah. 
Now, this is what I say. I say le designing learning experiences is a scientific process. So you can see it's step by step. It's very clear. There is a clear cut process that we go through with artistic and aesthetic touches. OK, so it's both science and art. Why? To ensure learners are provided with the most optimum circumstances for learning. OK. Like I said earlier <clears throat> in the first part of this workshop, we can provide the best environment, the best tools, the best content for the students so that they will be motivated to learn, have that intrinsic motivation in the ARCS model just now. OK, looking again at the ARCS model, <clears throat> Our experience uh, that we design must gain their attention, show relevance, builds their confidence, and then they will be satisfied. So this is what it's about. This is what designing learning experiences or designing courses, as we call it, would be ensuring that learners are given the best circumstances for learning. Now we have to factor in the technology uh, part, such diverse technolo technological needs that we have to address. So our job is probably getting more difficult, of course, with this uh, circumstances that we are in. Uh, but anyhow, uh, we need to make the best out of the situation. Lah. OK. So that is my introduction to what instructional design is and how it is relevant in designing and developing courses. Okay, because this is really what we are uh, going to do. Now, out of the books that I have uh, gone through, I've read on curriculum design, on you know, um, designing experiences for the students and all that. They all talk about the same thing. It's this. It is a scientific process. We have to make, um, you know, conscious decisions uh, on whether we choose certain materials. How do we uh, arrange what we're going to do first, what we're going to do next? Are we going to let them watch video? Are we going to include this in the learning outcomes or not? Uh, are we going to use paper and pencil assessment? Those are all building up towards this um, optimum circumstances for learning. All right. Now. We are going to do a little bit of hands on right here. We're going to use this knowledge of instructional design in designing the learning experience. OK, the course that we're talking about in the title of this workshop, designing and developing course, it really is a learning experience. It has the content, it has got the activities, it has got the assessment, it's got the teacher, it's got the student, it has got the um, technology we're doing, we're dealing with, the environment, the place, the time. So it's everything in that particular course. OK, so we're going to go through the first phase in any instructional design models or process they must be doing some sort of analysis. We ask questions. Now I have narrowed it down, simplified it to these five questions first, okay? First is, who am I teaching? Second, what am I teaching? Third, why do they have to learn it? Why do the students have to learn it? And number four, where am I teaching it? And number five, when am I teaching it? These five questions need to be answered before we get into defining learning outcomes or designing the assessment or deciding what activities we're going to do. OK, so how, what am I going to do? Uh, I mean, what is the activity that you're going to do for this part is uh, I want all of you to answer these questions based on the subject that you're going to teach next semester. 
pick one subject and I want you to detail out as much as possible all of these five questions. Who am I teaching? What am I teaching? Why do they have to learn it? What's the big why? Where am I teaching it? And when am I teaching it? Where am I teaching it? Is like, um, you know, it's, is it going to be on uh, Microsoft Teams? Is it going to be on Zoom? Are you going to use Google Classroom? Where? The location of where all of these materials are going to be. When am I teaching it? What time do you think your class will be? Uh, is it going to be asynchronous, synchronous? So there's a lot of information that we need to gather before we decide on the learning outcomes, learning activities and learning assessment. OK, so I'm going to give you three minutes for this activity. Where do you do it? Go back to your Padlet. I'm going to leave this like a job. OK, go back to this. Uh, hang on. Padlet. OK, and uh, this here participant responses, right? So you add your responses here. Tell me what your course is. OK, here the analysis activity. OK, tell me number one. Oops, number one, your course. Number two. Who am I teaching? So number three, what am I teaching? And then why do they have to learn it? Number five, where am I teaching it? And when am I teaching it? Okay. So that will be your analysis activity. You can add your own response by clicking the plus sign, or you can just reply to my um, post right here under the analysis activity. OK, so I'm going to give you about three minutes for this activity until 1030, and we'll see how much responses we can get in the Padlet. All right. You may begin now. OK. You can simply reply or you can have your own. Um, box your own post up to you. OK. Of course, to reply, it will be a bit challenging. Lah. Okay. Okay, we've got one uh, response here, two responses, a few responses. Okay. Okay, great, great. Responses. Uh, yes. Quick, quick question. Yeah. Um, okay, may I know who that? Who is that? Can you see? Sorry, sorry. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Hi. Hi. I am a doctor, Teresa Lee. I. Okay. You hear me? Yes. Yes, Dr. Clarissa. OK, um, I'm trying to prevent an echo from happening, but it doesn't seem to is persisting. Uh, yeah, OK, um, this is actually about uh, one of the courses that I'm teaching because it's a legacy class that I've attended, taught by various people before me. And it's actually not very clear uh, in the objective as to why the students have to learn that class. I mean, even for me as a teacher, it's like what you say, right? There is the learning experience part, and then there's also a lot of information. And what I see in the way the course was designed is that okay. it's a lot of information. I don't even know how to tell the students why you need. It's a, let's say this is a class in drama. Why do you have to learn this? To be a good dramatist. 
because of the way it's structured. Even though I, it will be helpful to them, uh -huh. but it's not structured in a way that explains why it's helpful to them. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just want how much uh, change I could probably make to that because I cannot alter the cost line. It's already predetermined. Uh -huh. I can only alter like the content. But then I just feel like if the cost line outline is already uh, predetermined, mm -hmm. then it will look like a presentation of information regardless of how I alter the content. So, okay. yeah, that's the question. What was the, what was the course again? What was the name of the course? Uh, the course is a Western theater. So you're supposed to study the history and genealogy, you know, understanding how that uh, it has um, developed. I think from the earliest period uh, to the most contemporary period. Uh, and, and I think they're supposed to also identify certain important players, but it just felt like the way it's written out, it's like a, I'm writing an encyclopedia rather than teaching. <laughs> Okay. But I don't have that course, so I have no, no way. I don't think I can like you know go to send and say, hey, can you change this course just a few weeks before I'm supposed to start, to start teaching it? So. Okay, no problem. Uh this is part of an English uh, major. Uh, no, it's a theater major. Oh, it's a theater major. Yeah, okay. and it's a bit different because most students I think are used to more practical um way you know very bodily performative style of learning so you know then suddenly there's this odd cause that looks like a information dump on them i see okay uh so it is about western uh you know the history and stuff like that right um well why do they have to learn it there must be some reason why it's put in the whole ecosystem of the theater major. So perhaps it is to understand um, the diverse backgrounds of where theater comes from and stuff like that. So the why uh, the students have to learn it. Um, see, this is a classic example of, you know, when we ourselves can't decide why, why is this course right here because we're not the owners of the course, we're not the original authors of the course. Um, however, we can perhaps, you know, make it easier for the students um, by we ourselves, if we were in the students' shoes, yeah, and we are sitting through this course, we relook really into the course outline and we can actually tweak a little bit uh, the learning outcomes that the students need to achieve. <clears throat> um, it could be, <clears throat> uh, the learning outcomes, the specific learning, I mean, the course learning outcomes is there. It's in the course outline, right? Uh, it's perhaps, you know, difficult to change. But in the individual weeks, the individual topics, uh, the learning outcomes can be tweaked because those are dependent upon how we uh, lecturers are going to bring them towards that big learning outcome if you get what i mean later i think when we do the whole um, constructive alignment ac uh, exercise uh, you can perhaps see a little bit clearer what i mean by just tweaking the individual weeks or individual topics one at a time uh, so that the content will be made relevant uh, to the students yeah uh, dr clarissa so uh, we will go through that exercise later on and see if it helps you a little bit in uh, making it easier for you to tweak here and there uh, so that the subject will be made relevant somehow uh, without tempering the course outline. Is that okay? okay? Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you. So now we've got um, a lot of responses already. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, down here, the ones that are that have replied to me is environmental studies as PG students. Who's your who's going to be your students? And then um, critical care nursing is an environmental related issue information society. Uh, it's a core course. Uh, introduction to infectious disease. Um, apply theory at workplace. Uh, online once a week, six to nine p.m part of the syllabus, I suppose that's the why. And then there's digital image processing, second year students, basic algorithms, uh, techniques, and so that they know what really is happening when do uh, when they do manipulate their images. 
Okay, great. Uh, and then who am I teaching biomed? Why do they have to learn it? It is a must know molecular science tools. Okay, uh, when am I teaching it? Close to noon, uh, uh, Microsoft Teams. And then over here, uh, it's a core course. <clears throat> and then um, the level microeconomics overview. Uh, this one is overview of liver function. Okay, so we can see um, what I want to bring your attention to is the why of the teaching. Yeah. Basically, you know who you're going to teach. Again, the who can further be broken down. The who, master students. Master students, are they working? Are they not working? Are they full-time? Are they part-time? Um, what kind of commitment do they have? Um, what would be their family background? Um, what's their age? If it comes to master students, undergraduate, we basically know it's about, you know, that the age group is homogeneous. Um, but then again, you need to see right now they're learning at home, uh, what kind of environment they're in, um, what is their motivation, what's their prior knowledge, what level do they come in with. Um, so, answering the question who, right? I'm going to go back to my answering the question who in itself you need to really dig dig deep into your students it's not simply okay they're second year they are second year they, some of you might be teaching various majors uh it's like probably a general course uh you come in with you know diverse group of students so you see, you dissect as much as possible who these people are. That's the who. And then what's their interest, uh, you know. So as much information that we can get from the students whom we're teaching, it will be better for us to design it for them. OK. Uh, it is the same as, you know, the analogy is when we want to sell, for example, uh, phones, okay, mobile phones, you need to know the demographics. So that's how we decide upon our students. What's the demographics like? So that's the who. Okay, we further detail them out. The what am I teaching? Just like Dr. Clarissa just now, she analyzes the course outline. That is what I'm going to teach. That is the content. That is the, the course learning outcomes. The whole objective of the course being taught. OK, and then the question of why do they have to learn it? Where is the place of this course in their uh, learning journey? Yes, it is probably a core course. It is a requirement, but why was it made a core? Why do they have to get this piece of information? You know, for example, just now, um, this one is a good one uh, by HP Digital Image Processing because so that they know what is really happening when they manipulate images, right? So that is the big why. We want them to really know what is happening. And then um, over here, by Proteomics, Technologies. I don't know if I pronounce it correctly, but it is a must know molecular science tools. Why is it a must know? Yeah. Maybe it is a prerequisite to them knowing this knowledge, blah, blah, blah. So the why has to be very clear for us as well. All right. Uh, and then this one about microeconomics three is a core course continuation from micro two which deals with market structure and market failure so why do they need to know about market structure and market failure why where is the place of this knowledge yeah uh, to acquire the basic science knowledge for their clinical years so this is overview of liver function so this is the why they have to learn so you see when we are clear about the why um like just now uh, Dr. Clarissa has given a very good example of that particular subject. We're not quite sure why it's there. So we have to interpret the need 
for this course um, so that when we bring the students into this learning experience, it will be made relevant to them. OK, uh, students might. Uh, I mean, not might. students don't know why they have to learn it. I mean, you know, because everything is so new to them, especially for undergraduates, right? It is the first time they encounter with all of this um, high level knowledge, but we have to give them some sort of help mm -hmm. as to the why they have to learn this. We have to put them in perspective. Right, uh, and then um, in terms of answering the questions where and when it determines what kind of materials that we're going to give them, uh, what kind of platform we're going to use. Now, if the synchronous class is scheduled for like just now there's somebody with 6 to 9 p.m. Uh, and then this one is 1 to 3 p.m. It's, it has got to do with eating time, lunch time, whatever time, 6 to 9 is worse. Uh, where was the 6 to 9 just now? Uh, I can't remember where was it, 6 to 9, but never mind. Oh, there, there we go. 6 to 9 p.m. Um, it is probably when people want to go out and have their you know, physical activities, exercises. So all these things play a role when we want to uh, determine how we are going to maneuver the classes. It, the analogy again is like when you want to build a house um, at the hillside as opposed to next to the uh, as opposed uh, on the beach and all that. So those are the kinds of situations that architects and engineers need to figure out how to properly build a structure so that the house can withstand, can be uh, can, can be sustainable and all that. So for us, this is what we need to know. Yeah, uh, the the five questions right here. Where am I teaching? Where am I teaching? What do you have? Where am I uh, teaching it? And when am I teaching it? So this is our fundamental information that we need to know. OK, and on top of this five questions, we also need to look at what we have. Yeah, what do we have? What resources do we have um, in order to build this particular course or to build this particular learning experience after we have answered all those questions? OK, uh, usually people will ask me one of the questions that come out is what about the question? How am I going to teach it? The how is going to come in the design part. This is in the analysis part. We need to analyze what we have first. OK, needs analysis. The why do they have to learn it? We also need to address the gap in learning. OK, where are they? Where do they need to be? The gap in learning. That is one of the reasons why they have to take the course. To fill this gap. All right. Uh, that is the most I think simplified process of analysis. If you go through uh, an instructional design course that is very elaborate. There are so many types of analysis that you need to do. Um, you need to come up with a documentation document of your findings. It's like a whole research project. Yeah, but to inform our teaching, this is what I find the easiest to fall back to. This is enough information uh, for us to move on and decide, sit down. OK, this is what I'm going to do next semester for this course. All right, um, so I am going to pause there for a bit so that I can have room uh, to breathe and also for questions. If there are any questions, yeah. Uh, you can type it into the chat box so you can just switch on your mic. Okay. In, uh, is there any comments? Umu? Is Umu there? Okay. Um, no, not yet. Okay. okay, that's fine. So we're going to move on uh, to the next activity. Okay. 
Hang on. All right. So just now we have done analysis. With all of the information that you have got. Now we're going to begin designing. Look at these three. Finding outcomes, finding assessment, dominance, and decide learning activity. What are these? What's the name of this? Uh, three, the famous name. It is constructive alignment. Do not worry. I'm not here to talk about OBE or MQA or anything like that. I know a lot of academics are scared to look at this word constructive alignment because it, you know, like the audit and uh, things come in. But really, what it is, it's just talking about our learning outcomes, our assessment and instructional strategies being aligned. That's all. OK, that's all where we want the students to be must be assessed properly and we have to strategize on how to get them there based on the intended learning outcomes that we have already defined. That is simply what it means. Yeah, it's got nothing to do with any systems, any OBE systems, anything that need to check CLO with PLO with the LOs, blah, 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 and how you assess, blah, Bernie Bloom's taxonomy, da, da, da. That one is technical, it's too technical. The philosophy is this, where they need to be, we need to assess whether they've already gotten there and how do we help them to get there. Now that's constructive alignment. To make you really understand constructive alignment, because a lot of lecturers say that, OK, yeah, I know, I know learning outcomes, I know assessment, blah, blah, blah. But when I do this activity, um, they are not actually really clear about it, about the whole philosophy. I'm going to use running as an example of constructive alignment. OK? Running, imagine that you are going to sign up for a running event. You want to enter a race. What is the first thing that you need to know about the race? Before you even sign up, what is the first thing that you need to know about the race? You can type into the chat box and Umu can help me um, say out what they are. What is the first thing that you need to know before you enter a race? Hmm. Any runners out there? OK, what's the first thing that you need to know before you enter a race? Mm -hmm. Any feedback? Um, no. OK. Any of you runners out there? There are some feedback actually, but I think uh, can't be seen yet probably. Oh, really? OK. It's in the chat box or is yeah. it? Oh, OK. Chat. OK. Can somebody just shout out? What is the first thing that you need to know? Uh, mine is how prepared am I? How prepared you are? Is that the first thing that you need to know before you sign up for a race? What what are what are you preparing for? Uh, so who has tried running before? I think number one, uh, okay. how's my biological clock? Can I get up early enough? Okay. Right, and do I have stamina at the time of the day? Okay. Uh, what do I, what do I need to eat the day uh, before the event? Okay. In preparation for that, All right. I stay hydrated and what I carry with me in the race, especially if I'm running more than 10 kilometers. And uh -huh. I guess, uh, and what happens, you know, if something, if an emergency happens in the, during the race. So I think there's a kind of like a mental and 
physical okay. preparation. All right, thank you very much for your responses. Yep, those are the things that you do need. But there's this one thing that you need to know first before you even sign up, which is the distance. You need to know how far you are running first. Then comes the questions of what to eat, uh, what is your mental preparation and all that. But first, you need to know your finish line. Can I afford to run, for example, 42 kilometers marathon? Or is it going to be a 100 meter sprint event that I'm going to run, right? You need to know the end line first. Because that will determine whether you are going to go on a protein diet, you're going to go on a you know, carb loading kind of diet, whether you're going to do strength training, you're going to do endurance training, you're going to do cardio. So you need to know your finish line first. Okay. Once you know your distance, now you can evaluate yourself. Am I prepared for this distance? Because 100 meters is a sprint event. 42 kilometers is an endurance event. Totally different things, but they are both running. Okay. 100 meters, you need to be fast because you usually would want to win the race because it's about running fast. I mean, everybody can finish 100 meters even if they walk. But for 42 kilometers, there are two different outcomes altogether. Do you want to win or do you just want to finish it? Because it is a long run, right? So this is the outcome. This is the first part of the constructive alignment that you need to determine clearly. Where is your finish line? Where are the students supposed to be at the end of the class? Are they going to win this 100 meter race? Or are they going to be in this long 42 kilometer marathon to win or to simply finish? To master, really master content or just scrape through so that they just pass the course. Okay different outcomes altogether. This is the first thing that we need to know. And then we will decide how we want to prepare ourselves towards it. We practice getting up early. Uh, we do training every day. We jog for 10 kilometers or we need to do <clears throat> um, HIIT high intensity uh, interval training. So different strategies altogether for different distances. Yeah, this is perhaps the extreme distances that we're talking about, either 100 meters or 42 kilometers. But still, they are both running with different outcomes totally different outcomes and of course the strategies to get there are totally different okay even the people who are in this field you look at the build of um the fastest man on earth usain bolt he is big muscular um but if you look at the world marathon champion his name is kip choge He's very small, yeah, because you cannot bring a big, uh, you know, physique to run 42 kilometers and win every time because that's a big mass to carry long distance. You do need the muscles to speed. That's why you need the muscles. That's why, um, you know, Formula One cars have big engines because they go fast, okay? So this is the analogy of the constructive alignment just now. We need to know exactly the learning outcome, 
where is the finish line? We need to know how to assess. How do we give them a grade, whether they win the race or whether they finish the race? At what placing do they finish the race? And the strategies, what kind of training regime they go through? What are the activities? Are we going to choose problem-based learning? Are we going to choose service-based learning? Are we going to use technology? Um, are we just going to lecture them? So the strategies would also be determined by the clarity of the learning outcome. All right. So that's constructive alignment for you. We're going to practice this. OK. Imagine that you have been assigned to teach laundry management to seven year olds. Now I'm bringing down the age for you because I want you to practice this clarity. OK, seven year olds laundry management. This class is going to be one hour long and it's going to be online synchronous using a video conferencing tool. So I've given you all of the um, setting that you need to deal with. I want you to define one learning outcome. It's one learning outcome, all right? Teach laundry management to seven-year-olds. Class is one hour and will take place online, synchronous, using a video conferencing tool. I want you to define one learning outcome. Okay, where do you write this? I want you to open the Padlet and there is under the activity, there is laundry management right there. So click on it and you would be brought to this spreadsheet and Google Docs, uh, Google Sheets. Okay, laundry management activity. I want you to type in your learning outcomes right here. Just the learning outcome. Okay, not the assessment. All right. So do this activity for I'll give you two minutes to define one learning outcome for this laundry management for seven year olds. OK. Go to your Padlet and I see um, you have all gone in to the Google Sheets. Excellent. So just type in one learning outcome. Only in the outcome, don't need to do the assessment activity yet. OK, so just choose a box wherever you want to type, whichever number. Just don't uh, overwrite your friends. OK, if you were to send your child for this uh, laundry management course, what would be the learning outcome? Right, I've got one already to be able to sort the clues according to color, sort according to fabrics. OK. <clears throat> Let's see. OK. Just choose a box and type in. OK. Identify items needed for washing, able to measure detergent needed based on amount of clothes. Excellent. OK, what else? To be able to operate the laundry machine. I think people are like deleting. Uh, the first column so you can choose the one at the bottom so that you won't delete uh, your friends. Inputs. OK. You have skills to fold clothes. OK, what else? OK, you can choose a different. Oh, no. Number one uh, column has been overwritten so many times. Let me see. How do you say on laundry load? 
to know how much to charge based on size of clothing, okay? <laughs> Identify the steps in doing laundry, okay? Just now I think somebody wrote sort according to colors, right? Sort according to colors. Okay. You can go out in different places. Okay. You have the skills to fold clothes. Yep, definitely. Okay, great. So now, um, these are all very, very clear outcomes. Yeah. So how to decide on laundry load, sort according to fabrics, able to measure detergent needed based on amount of clothes, sort according to colors, have the skills to fold clothes, to be able to sort laundry into colors, able to know how much to charge based on size of clothing, identify the steps in doing laundry. You know, this one is very rare. Uh, this is an, a business side of it, I think, number eight, okay? Um, okay, great. So now these are the learning outcomes that you have decided upon. Next, okay? Now I want you to determine the learning assessment. How will you assess the outcomes that you have identified just now? What would be the form of assessment that you're going to do? Okay, go back to this um, spreadsheet. And then I want to now type the corresponding learning assessment that you're going to do. <clears throat> how do you assess how to decide on laundry load? How do you assess sorting? How do you decide all this? Type it in the learning assessment in your box, okay? Make sure you don't overwrite to your friends. Okay. See? How you want to assess? What form of assessment? Hmm. How do you assess? Interesting course, right? And would you send your children to this course if I organized it? <laughs> it would be really helpful, right? Okay, now there's one. Have the skills. That's observation right there. Uh, sort according to colors, give the child a mixture of different colored clothes and ask him or her to sort it. Okay, now bear in mind, remember, this is an online class, can online synchronous class. Uh, know how much to charge, then provide, okay, this one, provide a price list based on size and get them to calculate the cost. Wow. Okay. Uh, how to operate laundry machine, observation. Okay. Look at the day's laundry pile. Uh, provide different types of fabrics. Okay. And then uh, give the child make sure of different color clothes. Okay. Okay, so now, um, remember this is online. How would you provide different types of fabrics? Okay. Able to measure detergent. Number three, able to indicate amount of detergent used based on what is shown on detergent box. Okay, so what is the activity there? How are you going to tell that the students can use the right amount of detergent? Um, turn it up what? It's online, remember? Okay. So there we go. So we have how you, you basically have an idea on how to assess, right? How to decide on laundry road uh, and all these things are very practical. 
the assessment that you're going to do must take into consideration the environment that they are in. If they were to come to us in a physical setting, it would probably be easy because we would have the clothes, we would have the washing machine, we would have, you know, all the uh, racks that is needed. Okay. But then in an online setting, that is the big challenge right there. We have to depend on what is available in the student's environment. That is why we have to answer the question who just now. So that we know how to properly design our assessment. Now, of course, finally, we're going to decide on the learning activity, right? Now, we have got one person who has already written down on the learning activity, able to measure detergent. Um, teacher show pictures of half load and full load and ask students to indicate how much detergent to use for each. Okay, so that is one way of teaching this. How would you teach all of this? You can you know, fill up the last column of learning activity. How are you going to teach all this? Okay, so I use video sharing session. How are you going to teach it? Oops, sorry. Show video. All right. So this one, uh, give the video, do a quiz. Okay, great. So now how do you teach all of these? Now I'm going to bring your attention to this one, yeah? Able to measure detergent, able to indicate amount of detergent, you said teacher okay like over here yeah this this row teacher to show pictures of half load and full load and ask students to indicate how much detergent to use for each okay now our teacher is going to show a picture okay this is picture one this is full load this is half load for example this is how much detergent do you need this is how much detergent you need okay would this be a better option than we, the teacher, show real basket okay, of full load and another basket of half load, like concrete basket of laundry. And then show the box, the detergent box, for example, the detergent box. Say, okay, full load, this is how much. Now you show the cup. This is how much is needed. This is how much is needed. Which one is more practical? This one, the one where you actually show the laundry, or, or you want to use pictures. Okay, and there is another one right here video showing. Remember, this is online with seven year olds. You are there as a teacher. Now, if you were to play a video, if you remember just now, Umu was trying to play the video that I asked you to watch on your own, but there were some technicalities that happened. To me, my best experience with online teaching is to just actually show it live in front of the camera, as opposed to getting them to watch a video of that practical thing that you want them to, to do. You want them to fold clothes, you show folding clothes in front of the camera. That is more engaging than getting them to watch a video. Okay? So these are the things that you need to decide. This is an aesthetic touch that I have explained to you in my general overview of what designing learning experiences is. Okay. 
the more concrete it is, the more interaction that you have with the students, the better the experience is for them. Even when you want to do asynchronous sessions, when you record yourself teaching, doing all of these practical activities yourself, it is much more effective than if you were to use illustrations or if you were to use somebody else's video because the student want to engage with you. That's why you are the teacher. I am not saying that you have to create videos after videos or do live session after live session because there are a lot of good material out there. But the thing that you need engagement with your students, you do it. Okay, there are certain things that you need to do yourself. There are certain things that you can use materials from outside. Right, that is a human touch that we're talking about. That is the relevance in the arts model. OK. So now when we look at the learning activities that you have um, given me right here. See? Show demonstration video. This is steps of doing laundry. Right? Identify the steps in doing laundry. Instead of you showing a demonstration video, it is better for you in this live session. You do it, not a video. OK. So in another activity that I have given uh, my participants, they have to do a de design like this, but for brushing teeth. Some of them say, OK, we're going to find an animation of how to brush your teeth properly and get the kids to watch. Guess what? The kids are more engaged when you, the teacher, hold your own toothbrush and say, hey, hey, this is my toothbrush. This is how you brush your teeth. Okay, now everybody hold your toothbrush like this. This is how you brush your teeth. Uh, you go in circular motion. Okay, now you follow the teacher, everybody follow. So that is more engaging. Of course, this is for six year olds or five year olds. There is a child in everyone. And that inner child is craving for attention from the lecturer. So if you do have synchronous sessions, you know, make it engaging like this. And sometimes get them to, you know, uh, switch on their cameras, not all of them at once, maybe those who you want to address and have an actual interaction. OK, that is more human and that is where the aesthetics part come in. All right, so we're going to leave this laundry management sketch out. OK, so that is. What I would like to bring your attention to when it comes to. Um, constructive alignment. And this is an example of my class. The topic that I'm teaching is active learning strategies and these are my learning outcomes. Students will be able to explain various active learning strategies. Students will be able to choose suitable active learning strategy to assist learners in achieving specific learning outcome and they will be able to incorporate. So these are my learning activities. Yeah. When do I get them to watch the video? It is pre live before I go into the synchronous session. They will be watching videos I have prepared for them. During the live session, there will be active discussion. Interactive and with me in there, of course, being part of the uh, learning ecosystem. And then finally, after the live session, they would be doing an activity that is related to the topic the deadline for that is usually within the same day or the next day. 
and the feedback is given one to two days after that. Very short and very fast because we want to close the learning cycle quickly. We want to give them a closure to the whole topic that is being discussed for that week so that they can move on to the next one in the arts learning model just now. Make it relevant to them, build their confidence. They can do it on their own. <clears throat> they are satisfied and they can move on to the next, next topic. So it's a very fast cycle. OK, that's why in online learning or in hybrid learning, wherever learning, we need to focus on the must know. This is the very important uh, point that they need to achieve. The good to knows, they can learn it later. They can learn it on their own or you can be giving it to them um, as an enrichment activity, which we will talk about uh, later in the afternoon. OK, so just an example of constructive alignment uh, for my class. All right, so I'm going to pause here a little bit and uh, give room for any comments or any questions that you might have. Uh, it can be in the chat box or it can be, uh, you know, spoken through the microphone. sharing first. OK, uh, if you're still here with me, can you raise your hand? Like click on the raise hand thing, the icon. OK, great, 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 great. Thank you. Thank you for being here still. OK. OK, you can unraise your hands now. Does anybody want to say anything? No? You're good. It is very tiring. For uh, online. Hi, hi. Hello, yes. Can you please share some examples of learning activities that help students to learn by experience? That get students to? It helps students to learn by experience through the five senses. Okay, okay. So thank experience you. through the five senses. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your question, Dr. Wu. How June? Yeah. In an online learning setting, uh, to get them to use all of the five senses, we need to utilize their learning environment. Okay. Um, for example, I would get my students to actually bring in their food with them <laughs> into the class, uh, into the online class. I know it sounds very like what eating why has got because you are activating their sense that their taste, yeah, and their um olfactory. Uh, they can smell the food and it gives them a very good environment and that good eating experience during class is somehow anchored uh, into them. Uh, another way of doing it uh, with the holistic uh, person, all of the senses is of course using some music, using some sound uh, in some stimulus, not all, uh, and then getting them to of course type uh, their responses using the chat box. That's why I like to use um, Zoom or WebEx because I, I can just stay in Zoom <clears throat> and do all of these activities that I've done with you using the Padlet because I did not need the Padlet if I were to stay in Zoom. I can use the annotate uh, function um, and then I can use the breakout rooms. I can use all of the tools without going out um, of the environment. Uh, and of course, because I teach a lot uh, of instructional design things and also instructional technology, uh, internet applications in education and all that, um, we go into social media um, and then uh, 
of course, we take photographs. Uh, it is not just about the synchronous learning uh, that we need to activate their senses, but also in the asynchronous activities, you can do it there and get them to explore the environment, of course, uh, get them to interview people, interview their family members, uh, get them to interact with real people. Uh, for example, when I ask them to, you know, explore video conferencing tools, because yes, they are going to be teachers and they need to learn all of these tools uh, that they can use to teach. I get them to record uh, their session with their friends um, using this particular tool. So there's interaction in there. Uh, and then, yeah, just use the environment as much as possible. Uh, I'm not sure how you will do it for other courses, but of course for my course, it's very hands-on, very practical. Um, get them to use uh, real objects uh, to, you know, to do their analysis and stuff like that. So depending upon your courses, of course, have all of these elements, even interacting with another human being uses all of the senses. Uh, we do not have to sort of uh, assume that when we talk about using all of the senses, they need to play, they need to be physical. No, simply interacting, simply talking to another person uses all of the senses because you need to use your eyes, your hands, your gestures, and uh, everything. So it's just involving the whole body, not just simply sitting down and listening uh, or just watching video, which is very one way, have two way kind of activities, uh, interaction and all that. So I hope that answers your question, uh, Dr. Wu, how would you? Yeah? Yeah, yes, thank you very much. All right, thank you. Uh, all right, any other? Questions? Anything in the chat box? Umbo? Hi, uh, Dr. Rusmaliza. Hi, my name, is, my name is Raja Elina. I'm from Faculty of Medicine. Um, I just have very quick questions. Um, we all have to also do somewhat like what you're doing, where we're actually going to upload pre recorded videos for the students, and then we'll have an hour sessions on this slot that is the, uh, that's already being uh, scheduled for in the lecture slot. So that discussion is supposed to get um, what you're saying, the interactions between the students and whatnot. My question is that there is a there is a set of learning outcomes or objectives for individual lectures and usually there are quite a number of them for individual lectures that can be covered in an hour mm -hmm. so when you do come for these sessions and you want the students to engage and try to you know get um, different ways in getting them to um, understand the materials that you pre present to them earlier on mm -hmm. it's somewhat is going to be difficult for you to try to cover all the learning outcomes because you don't really know whether the students have actually watched your pre-recorded videos, if they watch how much they understand. So what tends to happen is that lecturers sometimes just summarize back their lectures or they tend to just even uh, you know, reiterate some of the salient points and that could take up a lot of time during that discussion time. And it ended up that, um, you know, I don't know how to balance achieving all the learning outcomes for that particular lecture, but at the same time, you are trying to um, engage the students so that they are not, it's not repetitive from what your, you know, the pre-recorded lectures. You've got any comments on that? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Raja Elina, for that, uh, you know, that question always comes up um, because lecturers tend to, uh, you know, re-explain what was supposed to have been explained in pre-recorded lectures. Uh, we do not know how much the students have gained from what we have prepared for them. One way that I have done is I will get them to write a reflective short, uh, you know, not essay, but a, a short reflective minute paper on what they have watched. Uh, and I have an e-portfolio, so all of my students would record all of their assignments and activities and all that in that e-portfolio. So after watching each video, they would give me a reflection, not a summary of the video. No, they would give me like questions, um, you know, 
what happens if I use this in another situation? What happens if the students are not blah, blah, blah? So it is more reflective. When it is reflective, we know that they have watched the video critically. But if it is just a summary, that means they are just watching it passively. Uh, the critical reflection thing need not be long. It can be like a two, three liner. Uh, they can ask questions, get them to ask questions, write questions based on the stimulus that you have given them, if, uh, be it a video or something that they need to read. So when, we know when they ask questions, means they have read it. And to come up with questions is more difficult than coming up with a summary. OK, so that's one way of doing it. Another way, another famous way is, of course, we giving quizzes uh, after they have watched the video. So that is more of us making sure that they watch it. But the other one, the reflective summary or asking them to write questions based on what they have watched or read, uh, that is more of us getting them to learn it rather than just watch it passively. So. Perhaps you can try this out next semester and see how it goes for you. Uh, it is an indication of whether, again, your material is clear or not, uh, whether it is, you know, is the length okay, is the duration okay, and um, is it understandable by the students? Uh, so it gives us feedback as well when we ask students to do that. And it saves time uh, for us later on uh, from having to re-explain uh, the whole lecture again. And then when you come in, uh, you would bring up all the questions that the students have asked in your, you know, in your assignment that you, you ask them to watch a video and come up with questions or reflections. Um, those points you would bring into the class and use them as discussion points. Jadi, you, you can gauge you know, where where the students are in terms of their understanding and in terms of their learning outcome achievement. Then after the discussion, you can give them the assignments or other activities or other quizzes that would follow up um, that particular discussion on the on the topic. So I hope that uh, helps to answer the question. I mean, it's not a perfect way, but it is one of the way that has worked um, so far. All right, thank you, Dr. Raja Elina. Thank you for the suggestion. It's just, I think it's very well uh, probably suited for small groups, but when you're dealing with more than 150 students at one time in the lecture to read all of the, uh, you know, reflective um, before lessons and you've actually got, you know, tons and tons of lectures might not be uh, necessarily very practical, but certainly for small groups, I will try to, you know, um, implement that. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. For large groups, of course, it's it's a big headache still. Um, we do need the tutors, we do need the tutorial sessions uh, to assist us in, uh, in you know, delivering our materials more effectively. Of course, large groups is, is not an easy task. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Raja Elena. I think uh, HP, uh, somebody has their hand up. Who's HP? HP, HP. Uh, who has your hand up? Because <laughs> in my icon here, okay. Uh, Hani Zura, is it? Do you have a question or you just uh, did not click off your raising hand? I'm sorry, but I did not raise my hand. I did not click it. <laughs> oh, okay. What is that? <laughs> <laughs> I did not see. I just click it uh, last time when you asked who's around. Ah, okay, okay. All right, okay. All right, no problem. That's okay. I was wondering. Thank you so much. All right, okay. okay. All right, no problem. Now, um, I'm going to share my slide again. Okay. And now, another um, take on instructional design uh, in the academic setting. Robert Gane um, has listed nine things that should happen in a class. Nine things that should happen in an instruction. 
for the uh, session, for the learning section to be effective. First, he said, you need to gain your students' attention. Number two, you need to inform your students of the learning objectives of the day. Number three, you need to stimulate recall of prior learning. Number four, present the content that you have. Number five, you need to guide them with using the content. Number six, elicit performance or give them practice on their own so that they know how to use the knowledge and skills. And then number seven, we need to provide them with feedback. And then we assess their performance. And finally, number nine, enhance retention and transfer, which simply means we give them enrichment activities or longer project so that they know how to use the knowledge and skills in other situations or in the real world setting. Ghani said these nine things have to happen in a learning experience. Okay, what does this mean? It means for numbers one, two and three, these need to happen. Okay, I will use my annotation. Okay, for number one, number two, and number three, they have to happen before we present the actual content. Gaining attention means sparking their curiosity. This one, gain attention. They need to be curious. They need to be ready for the lesson. And then number two, when they are ready for the lesson, now we tell them, OK, today this is what we're going to learn. Inform students of the objectives. And then you have to connect today's lesson to what they have already known, their prior knowledge. When this all have been triggered, then we will present the new content that we want to present to them. This is what Ghani says. The students must be ready for receiving new content. Once we have presented the content in some form, now we need to guide them first. Learning guidance. Guide them first before we leave it for them to do the work independently. OK, we need to give examples. Uh, we need to give them like, you know, notes, how to solve certain problems, give them similar uh, situations that uses the theory or the uh, formula. And then only we can give them assignments. When we give them assignments here in illicit performance practice, we have to provide feedback. Providing feedback, immediate feedback, is crucial in closing the loop of learning. They need to know whether what they are doing is correct or not, whether they need to improve, uh, whether they can move on to the next topic, but feedback is important. So when we give any activities or any homework, any assignment, we have to do our part in giving feedback providing feedback, OK? In online learning, what I would suggest is the assignments to be chunk. You know, we always learn about chunking content. Uh, you know, the technology allows us to chunk content, have short videos, blah, blah, blah. Goes the same for assi assignments. Chunk the assignments, OK? Give them bit by bit that is manageable for them to do and manageable for us to provide feedback. If it is a long assignment, break them down into phases. So they give you a certain output and we feedback and then they can improve and move on to the next topic. This is very important in online learning because of the absence of our presence. 
our physical presence there and the uh, physical presence that we can gauge whether they are with us or not, whether they have mastered the material or not. So this constant feedback that we give them is key to engagement. Okay. Uh, if we continue to do to give them sync, uh, asynchronous materials, they watch videos and then um, they answer one or two questions and then they're synchronous and then we give them a long assignment and we will market midterm like tiga empat minggu baru jangan nak dapat and all that. That loses the connection. They are not engaged with us. Right? For those who give constant feedback, you find that the engagement is more with the students and that they are kept on their toes. Do not give long, lengthy assignment, but rather short ones that they can complete. You know, one or two questions instead of five questions. Um, get them to do minute paper instead of writing long essays every time. So chunk. This week, they will give you maybe you know, it's a long assignment. This week they would give you the first part. Next week they give you the second part. So it's manageable to give feedback. Yeah, uh, and have, you know, an e-portfolio where they can um, keep all of the assignments and it's easier for us to trace. It's easier for them to trace. Okay. And then only we talk about assessment, then we can decide. You know, from the um, assignments that we have given them, the short assignments that we have given them, we can decide which ones to grade, which one to give grades, and we can inform our students so that they'll be prepared. Okay. Number nine, enhance retention and transfer. Now, this is what we call um, applying it to the real world, applying it in diverse context in different situations. This can be your problem based learning can be the final project that they work on that consolidates all of the knowledge uh, and seeing the real world application by the students. You know, to see if they understand the whole thing, if they are able to apply, they're able to create, you know, all the Bloom's taxonomy verbs. Right, so this um, whole guide given by Ghani gives us an indication of whether we have prepared our materials enough or not for the students to learn. Okay, now this Ghani um, that uh, you know I have uh, studied what he recommended. I turned it and I simplified it. I created this learning design matrix, which is like, you know, simply a table. Aligning just now, we did the learning outcomes, learning assessment and learning activities. And I have enhanced it by including Gani, pre-instructional, content presentation, learner participation, and the follow through. Okay. It's a simple table that lays out all of the learning outcomes and learning assessments and learning activities. While taking into consideration Ghani's um, recommendations for what is supposed to happen in the classroom. Okay. Pre-instructional includes just now number one, two, and three. One, two, and three. Gain attention, inform students of objectives, and stimulate recall prior learning. Okay, that's pre-instructional. Content presentation is content presentation. Learner participation is provide learning guidance, elicit performance, and provide feedback. Five, six, and seven. Okay. And then follow through. And of course, you have the assessment here and the follow through activity. 
which is an extension of what we have done with the content to see real world application. Okay. This is just a table representation. <laughs> it's nothing fancy. It's just a way for me to easily see what I'm doing in class is complete or not, whether I have, you know, taken care of everything or not and see whether it's aligned. And also to see the variety of resources that I give my students to involve the census study. OK. See the, the little eye icon right there. OK. And then the uh, ear right there. The hand right there. It gives me an idea of how much variety that I have put in in my learning materials. Okay. I even include the writing, read and write. You've got to read something. So they have to read, they have to use their eyes, they have to watch, they have to do something with their hands. Um, they have to use their ears. They have to talk to people put back the you know, social element in learning. So with this table, I can see everything. That's all. There's no new theory into it, nothing. It's just me visualizing what is to be done for maximizing or optimizing the learning circumstances for my students. Right. So, and I just named it the learning design matrix. So this has uh, been very helpful for me and also for the lecturers who have used it. I've got good feedback. Um, engineering lecturers, uh, medical lecturers, they have used this and they say, yeah, it helps them visualize. Now I'm not advocating that you have this for each and every lesson. I mean, it's going to add on to our paperwork and you know, we have to do research, we have to teach and online stuff. So it's a burden, but at least it gives me an awareness. It makes them aware of the choices of learning materials that we choose. And if you can see right here, um, I wrote that flow. Learning outcome one, two, and three, they must flow. One builds upon another. So the whole thing becomes a story. Yeah, it is a whole story. When we are teaching, we're telling them a story. There is a beginning, there is a climax, and there is an ending. It is how we tell that story that is engaging the students. All right, so it's, uh, you know, it's something that we are going to practice this afternoon. This afternoon we will do this, yeah. Um, practically, we will attempt to do this for your courses that you're going to teach next semester. And then you will start to realize once you do it, when you, once you put it down on paper, then you start to realize, hey, you know, I actually have a lot of materials that I can use and I need to spread it out. This can be for asynchronous. This can be used for synchronous. Of course, this was built before um, MCO, before COVID. Um, you can always tweak it. You can put learning activities here. You can include synchronous, asynchronous uh, stuff. This one was built for hybrid learning, blended learning, of course, and uh, yeah, you can modify it as you wish, but the whole idea is to visualize what we're going to do in the classroom and to make sure all the resources that we have are fully utilized. OK. I'm going to just stop there for a bit and to make room for any comments or any questions. Okay. 
Hi, Doctor. I have one question. Yes. Uh, Jamie here. It's regarding your learning design matrix just now. Very interesting. Okay. Um, it's something like that will be always on my mind, but I never really put it down. <laughs> yeah, but that could be a good practice. But what I want to know is that regarding your uh, learner's participation, the last two, uh, second last column and the last column on the extended version, how different is it? Are they not one and the same? Because learners would participate, isn't it? Um, sometimes, there is, why am I asking this? Simply because sometimes you just take one lecture in a block, for example, you know, mm -hmm. so you don't really see them next. So how to go about fitting that last column into this kind of scenario? Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Jamie, for your question. Um, learning participation and follow through. OK, a lot of people are confused with this. Uh, the ninth step by Ghani, follow through or extended activity. Learner participation is we get them to interact with the content uh, as we teach it. For example, if we were to teach a certain um, physics formula, Newton's law, for example, uh, we present the content, we discuss the uh, examples and stuff, and then the learners would be solving problems using that Newton's law. Follow through would probably give the learner a project that has got something to do with Newton's law uh, in the real world. Okay, uh, maybe to look at, I don't know, uh, gravity to look at how things fall, you know, give them a certain problem for them to solve. Um, if you were to to have a one block, I know there are a lot of team teaching that's being done, especially in the medical field. Um, what you can do is um, you can collaborate between the lecturers to come up with this follow through um, activity to give them a certain you know, problem to solve, a certain uh, community service to do. So it is uh, a, collaborate, a collaboration between uh, lecturers to come up with one particular activity. It need not be an elaborate one, um, but for them to consolidate all of the knowledge that they have gotten from all of the lecture blocks. Right? So that's one, one suggestion that I have. Um, another suggestion is if you want to keep it to your particular, um, you know, subject matter in your particular area, you can have them do a small research uh, assignment uh, for them to be able to see the knowledge in use. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of medical lecturers in this uh, session today. So your follow through can be, you know, that particular where we're talking about the liver function, for example, the follow through can be um, them looking at a particular case of um, somebody with a uh, liver that has malfunctioned. I'm not sure I'm using the right term, but uh, it can encroach into a, a more advanced topic or, you know, something that is introductory for them. Uh, to move on to the next uh, level, for example, just to, you know, the, the idea is to get them to see the relevance of that particular material in another setting, in a real world setting, in a different setting. Um, how do they uh, see the content that we have given them uh, in other places? Okay. So that's the difference between learner participation and follow through activity. Of course, it requires participation from the learner, but this one is more specific towards them being able to use the knowledge in a relevant situation. That's to get the relevance in. Uh, when they find it relevant and usable, then they will be motivated uh, to follow through lah with the content uh, to keep with the content and you know they'll be excited to learn about it uh, a real example um for my class is you know uh there was once i was teaching this course called fundamentals of multimedia uh, you know looking at the types of fonts lah, looking at the different rgb spectrum of colors so it's very technical fundamentals of multimedia how I get them 
uh, to see the relevance is, you know, I get them to see the different um, types of advertisements that are out there uh, and looking at book prints, looking at poster prints, looking at different types of prints, different types of media materials and see how all of these different uh, multimedia elements are being used for different purposes. So then they see, uh, you know, the sans serif fonts, the serif fonts, uh, which one do we use for online reading, which one do we use for print reading. Um, you know, uh, when I presented this uh, one short session on infographics, on creating infographics to medical lecturers in UPM, they were like, oh, I did not know that, you know, different fonts convey different meanings and also have got different technical implications um, as to how we ease the eyes in reading and how we guide the readers through the reading of material. So that is a type of extended activity that we can use uh, in order for the students to see the relevance of the material. So I hope that answers your question, yeah, Jamie? Yes, thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, any other question before we take a break for lunch? It's almost 12. Um, I do need a break because three hours to talking, so <laughs> it's pretty long. <laughs> Yeah, I sh I'm sure you agree with me. Uh, any other questions in the chat box? Good, I did that. Yeah, I have a question. Hi, I'm Dr. Clarissa again. Hi, Dr. Clarissa. Yeah, yeah I have a quick question uh, relating to learner participation. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things I'm interested in, let's say, doing a tutorial session, because usually mm -hmm. you are kind of like present to help them. So I'm just wondering how to conduct student discussions. I mean, not like just one big group and meeting a discussion, but student-led discussions in small groups mm -hmm. online. I mean, especially when you're not living in the same physical space, so I kind of like have them all be in that space, you know, and me being virtually somewhere and talk, but they are virtual as well with each, each, each other. And also because I'm also worried about internet connection, even for myself, I don't always have the best internet connection. So I'm just worried mm -hmm. uh, that that might be a problem. And one of my ideas of doing or circumventing this, uh, and I've not really tested it out, at least not in the virtual setting, mm -hmm. is to have students like write wikis where they discuss and they do collaborative writing. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm not sure how easy it is to supervise such an activity online. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's probably possible because I've done it before, but it's never been done just like 100% online. Mm -hmm. Usually I'm able to kind of like uh, put in, intersperse it with other kinds of activities. Mm -hmm. And also because I don't normally use that as a purely discussion tool, that normally comes after the discussion, not as part of the discussion. But I mm -hmm. thought in case where asynchronicity is a necessity, Maybe mm -hmm. that is one we also show evidence that they've done the discussion and they're actually struggling through the questions and also coming up with their own questions and issues mm -hmm. that they're facing. What do you think of this? Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Clarissa. Uh, doing online discussion, uh, of course, we have to consider the bandwidth. One that I've done is on WhatsApp. Uh, the discussion is on WhatsApp and they have set up, you know, their own little group. Um, the outcome of that uh, discussion would be, you know, in the form of either a Google Docs or whatever that they have uh, been assigned to. So one way is on WhatsApp. They can have very active uh, discussion in WhatsApp, but without your presence. Uh, that's the thing. If you are present, then the discussion might not flow as good. So in this case, we have to sort of trust the students that the discussion does go on um, and the output of that has to be given uh, almost immediately. I think you don't give them too much time, uh, like two weeks. No, I think the most is until the next class. Uh, so until next week 
or give them two or three days, uh, provided that it's a very short discussion, uh, considering that they have a lot of other subjects that they need to discuss about. Um, but WhatsApp group is good, and then maybe sometimes you can intervene, uh, get them to join you in the group, and then you leave again after that just to touch base. I've never done that. I have never done that. Um, you know, intervention before I just leave them with their discussion. And if they have problems, then they would uh, consult me. Uh, but the output is there. Uh, I know that they have done the discussion because when I have group activities, I would always have a project log, a group log, meaning every time that they meet with their students, uh, with their group mates, they would login it's like a diary okay today i'm uh this is what we had we discussed this and my contribution is what so very short uh it's not very it's not even a long one maybe it's a, just one two liner what they did um so with that if there is ever a complaint that a you know a particular group member is not contributing i can always go back to the project log and most of the time if a group member is not contributing that same person would not be updating their e-portfolio spoon uh, so it's usually the same person kind of, that is causing problems <laughs> all the time so we know yeah. who to deal with yeah and um, that's one way whatsapp through whatsapp discussion okay. Yeah, and we can also have, uh, you know, Google Docs, uh, and we are part of that Google Docs. Uh, our presence there, we are lurking. Uh, we are not, uh, you know, in, in intervening too much, uh, but our presence is felt. Uh, we can always ask for a progress report. We can always have an uh, individual session with the particular groups who need it. Uh, our consultation hours are utilized using Zoom or even WhatsApp chat. Uh, I've done one live WhatsApp chat session in the sense that everyone is there at the same time. So we just WhatsApp, not no video whatsoever. It's just chatting. Everybody's there for about, you know, half an hour. Uh, we get all uh, they share their documents and all that. And then it's done. So it's no video, no voice whatsoever, and maybe some one or two would do voice uh, messages. So yeah, uh, those are the forms of group discussion that we can do. Uh, Clarissa, maybe you can share with us once you have tried different ways of doing group work. But so far, uh, that's what I have seen being done and also what I've done myself. I've done that, you know, live consultation via WhatsApp. Okay. Yeah. I can try that. I'll right. try doing this kind of formal stuff through WhatsApp. So we don't. Yeah, you just have to be a bit patient now with, with the typing and all that. So, um, yeah, you can try uh, various ways. All right. So, any other comments or questions before we break for lunch? No? Okay. So um, if everybody is still with me, uh, just click on the raise hand button uh, so that we are all on the same page that we would meet. Thank you. That we would meet back at 2 p.m. And this afternoon, uh, I'm going to let all of you use the learning design matrix and have a feel of how it is to organize your materials uh, and uh, visualize how your lessons are going to be. Okay, mm -hmm. so thank you. I'm going to sort of uh, switch off everything right now and I'll see you back at 2 p.m. Okay, have a good break. All right, thank you everyone. So see you at 2 p.m. I'll create another meeting room. It will call designing and developing courses uh, afternoon session. So if you um, have nothing, um, so have a great lunch. So we'll meet back at 2 p.m. Thank you.